This is a video about two alternative methods used for metal extraction. In Unit 4, which was the Chemical Changes Unit, you learned about electrolysis and also reduction with carbon. And now we're going to look at some slightly less common methods that can be used alongside these or instead of these. In this video, we're going to define the word ore and describe what the difference is between low-grade and high-grade ores. We're going to explain why alternative methods of metal extraction are becoming necessary as we start to use more and more low-grade ore. We'll describe the processes of phytomining and bioleaching, and we'll evaluate these in terms of their advantages and disadvantages. Before we start learning about these novel methods of metal extraction, we need to think about why they're necessary. This is a graph that shows the price of copper and how it changed over the 12 years from 1998 to 2010. Pause the video and try to write a sentence which describes how the price has changed over time. If you can, try to explain why this might be. Remember, in an exam, describe means to say what is happening, whereas explain means to say why it is happening. The price of copper has risen from 1998 until 2010. To start with, it rises very slowly, but later, from about 2004 onwards, it's risen much more quickly. The reason for this is that supplies of copper are running out, so the copper that's still available becomes much more expensive as demand for it outstrips the supply. Most metals are extracted from ores, which are rocks that contain enough of a metal compound to make extracting it financially viable. In other words, we can make money from it. There's no point in buying a huge piece of rock that has so little metal in it that by the time we've gone through all the mining process and the extraction process, we haven't got enough metal to make enough money by selling it to offset the extraction process. Now, it's almost always going to be a metal compound inside that rock because most metals will react with the oxygen in the air around them and other substances that are in their surroundings. It's only the very unreactive metals like gold and platinum that are going to be found as pure elements. Now, copper is a relatively unreactive metal. It's less reactive than carbon, and that means that most of the extraction can be done by reduction with carbon. This basically means if you have some copper oxide and you put it together with carbon and you heat it up enough, then because the carbon is more reactive, it will take the oxygen from the copper, and you're left with carbon dioxide and pure copper metal. Um, the products of this can later be purified with a method called electrolysis. Electrolysis is the extraction method that we have to use for very reactive metals because reduction with carbon won't work, but it's also good for purifying impure metal. Now, ores can be split into those that are high grade and low grade, and the difference is basically how much metal is in them. So in the days when copper wasn't particularly expensive, you would only want to extract it from an ore that had maybe 5% copper in it. But as copper has got scarcer and scarcer and the price has gone up and up, it's become financially viable to use low grade ores and will now extract copper from rocks that contain less than 1% copper by weight. After copper is extracted by using reduction with carbon, it can be purified using electrolysis. But this is a very expensive process because it uses a lot of electricity. So you might be wondering why we would bother doing it. Well, copper is a really useful material because it has very high electrical conductivity and also it's ductile, which means it can be stretched into wires. So it's perfect for making electrical wiring. If you look at this graph, on the x-axis at the bottom, we have the percentage of impurities in copper. And you'll notice that the highest number is 1. So this is copper that is 99% pure. On the y-axis, we've got electrical conductivity. So looking at these numbers, you can see that if we compare the completely pure copper to the 99% pure copper, the pure copper is twice as good at conducting electricity as the 99% pure copper. And so the cost of purifying the copper is offset by how much better it is for its purpose. Even though it's going to cost us quite a lot of money to purify the copper so that it's completely pure or nearly completely pure, it's going to mean that we can make more money because it's better at conducting electricity. Now we're going to look at these two new methods of extracting metals like copper, and these are both particularly useful when you're trying to extract a very small amount of metal, maybe just from the ground where it's not actually been in a rock, it's just sort of in the soil. And so they're really good for things like cleaning up old mining sites. Now, traditionally, if you've had a quarry, if you've had a mine, you do a process called leaching. And this involves using some pretty nasty chemicals, including cyanide, which is a poison, to remove the last of the metal from the soil. So if that's called leaching, bio-leaching means leaching using living things instead of chemicals, because bio means living. 
So for bioleaching, we use bacteria. And what the bacteria do is they remove the metal from the soil or from the leftover rock and they make a liquid called leachate. And the metal is then in that leachate. So we can then use displacement or electrolysis to extract the metal from the leachate and give us just the metal at the end. In terms of good things about it, it has very low energy costs. We're not having to do a chemical reaction or heat things up or use any furnaces. It's just the bacteria getting on and doing it for us. It doesn't release any harmful gases. There's no CO2 production, so no um, greenhouse gases. And also it's got pretty high extraction efficiency. So it's going to extract about 90% of the metal that's left in that soil, which is really good. The downside is that it's very slow and there isn't really a way to speed it up. It's not like a chemical reaction where you can heat it or add a catalyst. You just have to wait for the bacteria to do what they need to do. Phytomining is pretty similar to bioleaching in that we're using a living organism to remove small amounts of metal, probably from some contaminated soil. We're not expecting the plants to be able to remove metal from a rock, from an ore. Now, we use a particular kind of plant called a hyperaccumulator. So accumulation is about getting things together in one place. So you could imagine a dragon accumulating a stash of gold coins. And then hyper means that you do it more than is usual. So a hyperaccumulator is a plant that rather than just absorbing a little bit of metal ions from the soil is going to absorb lots and lots. Now, when the plant takes up the water and takes up the minerals that are in that water and it absorbs the copper, that's going to end up in its tissues, in its leaves, in its stems and roots and things. So in order to get the metal out, we need to burn the plants. And then what we're left with is ash, and in that ash are metal compounds. It's not going to be pure metal, because when you're burning the plant and getting rid of the carbohydrates and proteins and things that have made up the plant, the metal that's in it is going to react with oxygen. So you're probably going to end up with copper oxide amongst your ash. So we still need to extract that and we're still going to need to either dissolve it in some acid and displace it using a more reactive metal like iron or use electrolysis and that way we can get the pure metal. This is still quite a slow process because you have to wait for the plants to grow and naturally absorb the, um, the metal from the soil um, and it has higher energy costs than bioleaching because there's obviously the stage where you have to burn the plants and that's going to need some energy and it will release carbon dioxide as well because we're burning the plants. But we can describe this process as being carbon neutral. Now, what that means is that even though there's an amount of carbon dioxide that's released at the end of the process, that carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere to start with. But the plants did photosynthesis and they absorbed that carbon dioxide. And it's the same amount of carbon dioxide being given out at the end of their lifespan. So even though they are giving out CO2, it's not like burning fossil fuels where we're putting um, carbon that's been sequestered and locked up for millions of years back into the atmosphere. This is carbon that was in the atmosphere maybe a year ago. So that's what we mean when we say that it's carbon neutral. Another advantage of fighter mining is that you don't need to build a big quarry. So this is good from the point of view of causing less environmental damage, but also it's good from the point of view that it's going to cost you a lot less money than digging up big chunks of rock and taking them away on a lorry. A simple four mark exam question might ask us to describe how copper can be extracted by phyto mining. So pause the video and see if you can write down four bullet points that describe the process. Firstly, we should say that phyto mining involves plants. So the copper compounds are absorbed by plants. Then we need to describe how we get the copper out of the plant. So we talk about burning it. Then we should say that in the ash, there are going to be copper compounds. And it's important that they're copper compounds. It's not just pure copper. Finally, we should describe how it can be extracted from that. So the fact that we can use either electrolysis or displacement. You could also be asked about the main waste products from phyto mining. Remember, in your AQA GCSE science exams, they'll always put in bold the number of boxes that you're meant to tick. So as you burn a plant, you're burning lots and lots of carbohydrates and therefore you're going to release carbon dioxide, but also water. What about bioleaching? Can you give three reasons why bioleaching is better for the environment than traditional extraction methods? Well, firstly, there's the lack of quarrying. We've said that bioleaching is often done after quarrying, but it doesn't have to be. It's just that that's a really good place to make use of it. So because it doesn't require you to dig a really big hole in the ground and dig up big chunks of rock, there isn't that habitat destruction. And also there aren't going to be those lorries driving to and from the quarry with big pieces of rock. And they would be contributing to noise and dust and traffic. Secondly, there's the fact that it's very low energy. So whereas other extraction methods are going to use fossil fuels and burn them either to produce heat for, say, a furnace or um, to generate electricity, which can be used for heating that way, bioleaching doesn't do any of that. 
So therefore, it's not going to contribute to the release of carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. Finally, we know that traditional leaching uses harmful chemicals, including cyanide, and bioleaching doesn't need any of that, so it's not going to contribute to poisoning the environment. I hope that was a useful introduction to the topics of bioleaching and phytomining. Thank you very much for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more Unit 10 videos coming soon.